witchcraft, one of which in particular is called In the Devil's Snare, subtitled The Salem Witchcraft Crisis of 1692. And I very deliberately subtitled it Crisis rather than Trials, because the book is much broader than the trials themselves. When you call it a crisis, it's because there are so many things occurring outside of this very specific uh, instance of the witch trials. Can you talk about a few of those contributing factors? Well, I think in my book, I argue that the most important contributing factor is the um, Indian War that's going on on the northern frontier. Uh, we don't really know much about this war. I certainly didn't know much about it until it popped up as I was working on my, my study of Salem witchcraft. I did not intend to make the book what it turned out to be, which is a dual narrative of war and witchcraft. I did not understand the significance of the war until I kept coming across material relevant to the war in the stuff I was reading. And uh, I went to look for histories of the war and I didn't find any. Um, and this was why I didn't know anything about it was because there have been no modern histories of it. The most recent history to this day, the most recent history of the war, which is known as King William's War on the Northern Frontier, was written by Cotton Mather and published in the 1690s was the only comprehensive history that I found. And still, there has been not one. So I did not anticipate finding the war to be as important as it turned out to be. And before King William's War, there was King Philip's War. Yes, there was King Philip's War. And another problem with the literature on King Philip's War uh, until my book was that it's always focused on King Philip's War in the South. Uh, that is Southern New England, King Philip's War is thought of as an Indian war in the old Plymouth colony uh, in Rhode Island and in parts of Southern Massachusetts Bay. But I discovered that there was a Northern part of it also, which has been given very short shrift in histories of King Philip's War. There is one history of King Philip's War that gives a a chapter to the northern part of the war. But the King Philip's War is started in the 1670s, and um, the leader of the Indians was King Philip, um, a uh, Wampanoag chief uh, who was very concerned about English encroachments on his land and very concerned about missionizing activities of the Christians in his lands. Um, and he led um, his warriors uh, in raids, very devastating raids on New England communities. But the war um, leaked over, I think we can say, into the north. Uh, the Indians in the north, the uh, Wabanakis, did not particularly want to get involved in it, but they basically were forced to because of pressure from the Wampanoags in the south and from the English settlers who didn't trust them because of what was happening in the south. And in fact, the English uh, treated them extremely badly in uh, King Philip's War, um, did all kinds of things that you can only call nefarious um, to them. And so uh, they did become involved. And so the Indian War then became, in the 1670s, became general. Um, it was finally came to an end in more or less with a truce in 1678. And uh, the um, it was devastating to the English who had settled in Maine and New Hampshire. Uh, they had abandoned their communities in that period. They moved back in, um, and then the Second War started in 1688, and it all happened all over again. So it was devastating. It was devastating war. Um, we don't think of Maine as a very... Um, well, we don't think of Maine as a frontier. We don't think of Maine as a prosperous area. But in fact, Maine in the 1670s and 1690s was really where the action was as far as um, profit to be made in New England, in Boston. Uh, people had bought land. They had set up sawmills. Uh, Boston had a very vigorous shipbuilding industry that the sawmills in Maine were providing the labor, the, t the timber for the, um, the, um, there was a big bit, uh, business of masts of the very well 
built very well developed uh, pines um, which were perfect for ships masts in in Maine and so these people who owned this property in Maine were making money hand over fest and they also were fishing off the coast uh, and so there was a lot of money to be made in Maine. And basically the Indian Wars devastated the economy of Maine and Maine in a lot of ways never really recovered. Um, people didn't come back until the 1720s. And when they did, um, the, um, a lot of the entrepreneurial energy was gone. So it was really very bad. How did those same things and the economic woes mm -hmm. that were occurring because mm -hmm. of these wars, how did that affect the, the town of Salem and mm -hmm. the village? Um, well, what happened was um, all the people who had been settling in Maine had to go somewhere they, if they weren't killed. And so they filtered down into Massachusetts. They filtered down especially into Essex County, which is the northernmost county of Massachusetts, the northeasternmost county. And so a lot of the people came to live in Marblehead or came to live in Salem or came indeed to live in Salem Village. Uh, and um, in particular, one of the things that I discovered, I didn't discover it, I learned it in other people's work, but that I pursued to a greater extent than other people did was how many of the young female accusers were in fact refugees from the main frontier, uh, were people whose families had been killed uh, even though they had survived. And they had come to um, to Salem uh, or to the area of Salem and were living as servants or living with their families that were only, shall we say, partial families because people in the family had been killed. So um, I argue in the book that one of the reasons why these women were so um, conflicted, shall we say, um, was that we could in a modern sense, say they say that they were suffering from PTSD, that they had suffered such trauma on the frontier as young people that they um, acted out in 1692 in ways that helped to further, if not begin, the um, Salem crisis. I was very fortunate to be able to find in very scattered records um, biographical information about the youthful experiences of three of the young women, very explicit information about what they'd gone through as young children. And that was very helpful to my making my argument. Where did you find that? Uh, where did I find it? I found it in, actually, it was mostly published, but in sort of obscure places, um, in compilations of documents that were done in the 19th century. Until I wrote my book, nobody was focusing on it. Uh, until I wrote my book, nobody really focused on the war. It was listed, if you read most other books about Salem, there'll be a first chapter, and the first chapter will say sort of underlying factors behind um, Salem witchcraft. And one of them will be problems of the governance of the colony. And then there'll be other issues. But one of them will also be um, the Indian War. And it will get a few pages. Um, but the Indian War came to dominate my narrative because I think it dominated the lives of people then. And the way I said earlier, I, I, it, I didn't... Um, expect it. Um, but what happened was I decided to do something in my research that other people hadn't done, which was to look for letters written by anybody in the 1690s, hoping that I would find comments about Salem witchcraft, about witches. I was hoping I would find comments about what people thought about witches. It turned out there's only one really good set of letters that talks about witches, and it's in Dutch. So I had to rely on somebody else's translation of those. But what I did, so I was very disappointed because I got these letters that would say things like, five witches hanged yesterday, but then they wouldn't say anything about what they thought about that fact. Um, but what happened was, um, they were not telling me about the witches, they were telling me about the Indian Wars. The letters that didn't tell me about witchcraft told me all this stuff about the Indian War. You know, my cousin tells me from Maine that thus and such is happening, or I hear from New Hampshire that thus and such has happened. And it suddenly, the penny dropped that that was what was really crucial. That was what was controlling people. So I, um, 
added a whole lot of stuff about the Indian War to what was my previous idea of thinking about Salem witchcraft. Let's take it and boil it down into maybe an individual and, and try and just imagine what it would be like for a single human being living mm-hmm. in one of these mm-hmm. colonies. Mm-hmm. What kinds of horrors have they or their you know, family, mm-hmm. their family experienced? Right, right. Well, one of the people that I talk a lot about in the uh, book is Mercy Lewis, who was a servant in um, the home of Thomas Putnam, which is a crucial family for the uh, witchcraft crisis because his young daughter, Ann Putnam Jr., uh, was one of the first children who accused people. And uh, Mercy Lewis, I was able to discover, was from a family that had lived in what was then called Falmouth, Maine, is now called Portland, um, for a number of years, um, and I discovered that basically most of her family, except for her parents, were wiped out in the first Indian War, in King Philip's War. And then the ones who weren't killed in the first Indian War were mostly killed in the second Indian War. She and her sister alone were left. Her sister married someone in Salem Village. Um, in the late 1680s, as I remember correctly. And um, that seemed to me why Mercy Lewis eventually made her way to that area. She um, also, crucially, was a servant for a while in the home of the Reverend George Burroughs, who is a crucial figure in my book and who is someone who ties Salem Village together with, um, ties Salem Village together with, um, uh, the uh, main frontier because he worked both places. He was both a minister in Salem Village and a minister on the main frontier. And um, he um, and, and she lived with him for a while and she became one of his key accusers. And so did Ann Putnam Jr. become one of his key accusers. So I like to say when I give talks about uh, Salem witchcraft that I have spectral vi- a spectral vision of my own and that my spectral vision is of um, uh, Ann Putnam Jr. as the daughter of this family and Mercy Lewis as the servant sharing a bed in what would have been called the chamber, that is an upper room above the main floor, uh, and basically Mercy Lewis filling Ann Putnam Jr.'s head full of stories of the Indian War. And we see in Ann Putnam Jr.'s accusations in 1692, details about things that happened in Maine and details about George Burroughs that you don't see in, for example, the accusations of Abigail Williams, who is the niece of uh, the Reverend William Paris, of the Reverend Samuel Paris in um, in Salem Village, that to me was very telling. It told me that Ann Putnam Jr. had information about Maine. The only person she could have gotten that information from was Mercy Lewis, who was a servant in the household. So let's talk about power uh, within the colonies and how it ended up being subverted uh, throughout this crisis. How about consolidated? (laughs) I mean, what, again, I'm fond of saying to people when I'm trying to explain what the power structure of the colony was like at the time of the witchcraft crisis, I am fond of saying the following, that it, making the following analogy, that would be though in the U.S. today, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were also the president's cabinet and also the judges of the Supreme Court, because that's the power structure of Massachusetts at the time. The same men were the judges in the trials and the chief advisors of the governor and the men who led the local militia in the Indian War. So you talk about consolidation of power, there it is. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) That's a really good point. So we've got the power dynamics of the men who are there filling all of these roles. Mm -hmm. The same guys. Same same dudes. Right. Let's just go over the gender dynamics. So we have these powerful men. What? What do the women do? Well, the women are of different statuses. Um, There are the women who are married to those powerful men, and they are known as mistress. They have a a title. Um, And so they have a certain status in the community. They don't play much of a role in the the Salem crisis. We don't know much about them. We know about a few of them. 
um, ask Tad Baker about the wife of the governor, for example. Um, they, um, we know about some of them, but mostly we have ordinary women who are known as good wives or goody. And we have young women uh, who are uh, children. In the case of the three beginning accusers, Abigail Williams and, um, um, come on, I'm, now I'm blanking, um, Abigail Williams and um, Ann Putnam Jr. and uh, Paris's uh, daughter. Those are the children, and they're always called the children, uh, and they're always separated by, as far as other people are concerned, from the somewhat older accusers. Then you have the group of accusers who are the teenagers and 20-somethings, many of whom are servants, but not all of whom are servants. And then you have the older women, um, the good wives, the women of some stature in the community, mostly in their 30s, uh, a couple who are older, um, who play roles as accusers. And one of the arguments that I make in the book is that when it, it the children's accusations are not, it's not that they're not taken seriously, it's that they don't lead to political, they don't lead to judicial um, uh, ac they don't lead to judicial activity until somewhat older women and girls weigh in. There was a rule at the time in English law that uh, it was more, it was a common law rule, I don't think it was written down anywhere, that if you're, that the evidence of someone under 14 would not be uh, acceptable in a, um, in a um, capital case. And so the, I th and because witchcraft, of course, was a capital crime. And so I think that it, that in the beginning, they, the authorities in Massachusetts waited in effect for older people to weigh in. And what seems to have been especially important was when women in their 30s also became accusers, uh, when um, Ann Putnam Sr. became an accuser. When Sarah Vibber became an accuser, even though she was not a woman of particular standing in the community, my student discovered that she appeared in more uh, prosecutions than anyone else. Um, and so it was clear that a woman of that standing, um, who was seen as more mature, was more believable as far as the judges were concerned. Uh, I might add that the young woman um, oh, among the accusers, uh, Susanna Sheldon, who seemed to be the craziest, and she seemed to give the weirdest um, accusations. She, if you read her statements to the court, they're very strange. Uh, she is herself a refugee from the main frontier, living with her mother. Her father is dead. Um, and her older brother seems to have been killed in the Indian War. Uh, and she is often cited as an important accuser, but if you look at the legal records, she hardly ever appeared in a case. She doesn't, they don't let her swear to the truth of something, because I think they don't trust her. They only let people swear to the truth of something if they trust them. And I don't think they trust Susanna Sheldon. She is nuts. And they seem to recognize that she's nuts. They don't say that anywhere. But so I think people who have not paid attention to the way these testimonies are used in court miss out on a number of aspects of the trial and i will say that of the trials and i will say that the new edition of the papers done by the international team under the direction of bernard rosenthal has really helped us in this regard because they uh, give us all the legal notations on the documents that in fact sometimes were missing from the previous edition that we had to work with, which was based on WPA transcripts done in the 1930s. So the recent edition has really helped us with understanding the uh, legal process and how it was pursued. But back to your question about the, um, the believability or about the roles of these younger women, um, uh, one of the things I discovered from my previous book um, called Founding Mothers and Fathers, which is about um, 
uh, 17th century society in general and compares what happens in New England to what happens in, in the Chesapeake. One of the things I discovered from that was that young women tended to be disbelieved when they spoke in court. So to me, when I looked at the Salem records for the first time, uh, one of the things I was particularly interested in figuring out was why were these young women believed? Because young women in the past were usually not believed. And of course, my answer was the Indian War, because the consolidation of the power um, by the uh, in the hands of the judges um, and the uh, who were also the leaders of the war meant that they basically wanted an explanation for why they were losing the war, and they were losing the war because of witchcraft. QED. <laughs> That's a great soundbite right there. <laughs> Let's get into how faith shaped everything that occurred throughout this. Faith in what? Faith in witches? <laughs> Belief in witches? Everybody Belief. believes in witches. Belief in something greater or something a bit mystical? Yeah. And how the Puritan faith specifically shaped a lot of this. Well, um, actually, um, a lot of people in Maine were not Puritans. And so we don't know that much about what the refugees thought, uh, the people who came down into Salem and Salem Village, because Maine was settled not by Puritans, but for the most part by members of the Church of England, one of whom was my very own ancestor, but that's another story. And so um, the it's really hard to know. The uh, Certainly Cotton Mather, uh, who becomes a great defender of the trials, is one of the leading young clerics of the colony. His father, Increase, is gone in England for the f- previous several years. He's in England negotiating for a new charter for the colony, comes back with a new governor arriving in May, by which point the witchcraft crisis is well underway. There's lots of accusations by then. So um, certainly uh, Samuel Paris uh, is a believer in um, a very harsh version of Puritanism. He's known um, for his... um, very, what we'd say today, hardline sermons. Uh, he, he was having a big dispute with members of the congregation and members of this town in Salem Village. They were unhappy with him. They were withholding his salary. They were withholding firewood. He was not happy. And uh, so he started giving um, more and more angry sermons. Everybody had to attend. It was part of the law. Everybody had to attend church services, whether they were church members or not. So uh, everybody was hearing Samuel Paris rant and rave, and we're lucky that we have uh, transcripts that have been published of many of those sermons, so we have an idea of what he was saying. So yeah, I mean, Puritanism was important uh, to all these people, um, and they were, the, the faith was significant, and that faith included a belief in the existence of witches. In England at the time, there was beginning to be skepticism about belief in witchcraft, but not in America. Not really. They Even when the witchcraft crisis came to an end, it wasn't because people did not believe in witchcraft. It was because they came to believe that you couldn't prove someone was a witch in court legally. That was why they stopped. And uh, we have a letter that has survived from um, a, a magistrate, uh, in northern Essex County who who wrote a letter to a judge who was a friend of his and basically laid out, shall we say, the Puritan case for why you can't convict a witch on spectral testimony. And basically his argument was went like follow went as follows. Um, spectral testimony must come from the devil because God would never tell us uh, what's going to happen in the future. When God does not speak to us this way. We all know that. So it has to come from the devil. And if you are convicting these people on spectral, testi- on spectral evidence, you are convicting them on the testimony of the devil, and we all know you can't trust the devil. And so that's really why they stopped the trials. That worked. That worked. It didn't stop the trials. I should say, I should stop that. Because indeed, they did continue the trials after the dissolution of the, of the special court. They did um, get, um, they did in fact have three further convictions of people who had confessed, but all those people were, had their uh, 
convictions in effect overturned. Um, and in the regular courts, they did not allow spectral evidence. This is the trials that occurred in January of 1693. And um, so there were no executions after late September of 1692. And those were the last uh, executions that were based on spectral evidence. In part, I hasten to add, there was always other evidence too. There was no one who was convicted solely on spectral evidence. Uh, there were the what we would call the usual kinds of evidence of witchcraft, which is neighbors accusing someone of doing um, witchcraft against them. Let's talk about the Oyer and Terminer yeah. court and how it was different from from the proceedings that had happened prior to that. The only thing that's different about an Oyer and Terminer court is it's a special court. It's a court established by the governor for a special reason. Uh, there had been a previous Oyer and Terminer court in New York to try the um, people who'd been involved in a revolt in New York. Uh, it was basically the same model. There was nothing different particularly. Um, nobody, I should say, was a lawyer. Um, there were no lawyers involved in this except for the first prosecutor. He was a trained English lawyer. Everybody else was not a lawyer. Um, they, But they were experienced magistrates. They had served as justices of the peace for years. They had heard many small cases. They had even sometimes sat in capital cases previously. There were some pirates who were convicted and hanged previously in New England. So basically, um, uh, it's not as though these are not experienced people in judicial procedures, but that none of them were trained lawyers. They did have law books. We know that there was a bookstore in Boston that had law books that they bought and that they read. So we know they were self-educated, shall we say, about how they should handle things. Um, but a lot of things about the trials we don't know. For example, we know there were nine judges. We know there were supposed to be five at any one trial, and that at least two of those five had to be particular people. But we don't know about anything else. We don't know how many of those people actually sat in the, in the trials. We don't know who sat in particular trials, except we're sure that the chief judge, William Stoughton, who was the lieutenant governor of the colony, we know he was there pretty much all the time. We're sure he was there all the time. Other than that, we don't know. We don't know who was on the jury. We, uh, on the juries, we don't know if there were more than, well, we think there was more than one jury, but we don't know how many people actually served. We don't know if there were different juries for different trials. We do know that George Burroughs challenged jurors in his trial, and so new jurors had to be seated, but that's it. We don't know if the people who were the jurors before in the trials before Burroughs, were all the same guys? Was it the same people again and again? We don't know that. Um, we know that there was a second grand jury impaneled later in the system because we've seen the the call for the new grand jury. But again, we don't know. Was the first grand did the first grand jury sit throughout the entire early period of the trials? We have no idea. Those records are all gone. So, even though we have a lot of records that survive, there's many procedural things we don't know. And probably the best procedural evidence we have is the notations on some of the documents by the court clerk. Um, and he, um, he made uh, notations about whether something was sworn before the uh, grand jury, whether it was sworn in court itself. And so sometimes you get documents where they say sworn in before the grand jury and nothing else. And then there's other documents that say sworn in court and nothing else. And sometimes you get things that are said sworn in before the grand jury and sworn in court, but you don't know what the missing evidence means. And sometimes he, he even wrote a note on something which said, sometimes people just gave their testimony orally and I didn't write it down. So we have one note that says that. So who knows? Um, actually, sort of ironically, the best evidence we have about the conduct of the trials comes from Cotton Mather's account of five of the trials written to defend the trials themselves, written to defend the verdicts in his book. And he wonders of the invisible world. And he gives us kind of blow by blow descriptions of what happened in the various trials. And so we can see in some of those cases, 
that we have the evidence of the testimony that he talks about, but in other cases, we don't have the evidence of the testimony that he talks about. I think I and everybody else sort of assumes that he's telling the truth when he tells you that this is the testimony that's given in those cases, because there were too many people who were there and who could have said, no, no, you're a liar, Cotton Mather, if you're telling, telling us things that didn't actually happen in the courtroom. And so we think that he did, in fact, work off of records that are now lost. Uh, he got those records from the court clerk, from Stephen Sewell, who was the court clerk. And he know, we know that because he thanks Stephen Sewell for, he asked Stephen Sewell for those records and he thanks Stephen Sewell for those records. So um, there, we can pretty much believe them because in fact, when we do have the written testimony, that he describes, it's accurate. I mean, he describes it accurately. So we just sort of have to make certain assumptions. But he doesn't tell us how many judges were there or or things like that. So, um, but he does tell us that the um, accusers came in. He does tell us that confessors came in and so forth. So we do have that information from him. Now here in 2018, there are so many ideas of what a witch could be. What it, um, but in 1692, there is an idea of what a witch is, essentially, that's commonly shared with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe what that is? In 1692, or before, there were basically, a witch was basically believed to be someone who had some kind of access to occult information and powers. And the, but there were disagreement about that because there were some people who thought that that had to mean that they were in touch with the devil. There were other people who thought, no, no, there were what you might call today a white witch or a useful witch who could, for example, tell your fortune. Um, that was someone who had some mystical power. Um, the the um, ministers would say that that meant the person had to be in touch with the devil because that God would never tell you what the future was, although the devil might. And so any fortune teller, as far as the ministers were concerned, was a witch. As far as local people were concerned, that isn't true. Uh, lo a witch uh, who could tell the future or a fortune teller was not necessarily an evil person, was someone who could just help you or could give you a potion. If you were in love with someone who wasn't in love with you, you could get a, a spell to help you um, uh, make that person fall in love with you. Or if you wanted to know what had happened to your husband who was at, had been at sea for years, was he going to come home? The witch or the fortune teller could tell you that sort of thing. In fact, there's one of the women who's accused of witchcraft in 1692 who seems to have specialized in telling women that their husbands were never going to come home, that they were widows. Um, she seems to have liked to have given them bad news. So... Um, there's that kind of witchcraft. And then there's the kind of witchcraft where a witch is seen as being evil and uh, seeking to do bad things to people she doesn't like. It's almost always a woman, not entirely. It can be a man. And the as far as the local people are concerned, it's a woman. As far as the ministers are concerned, it could be a man. I should add that. And that would be if you get in trouble with somebody and they have, and, and let's say you have an argument with your neighbor, um, your neighbor's cows got into your cornfield, you're really mad, you go and have a conversation, more than a conversation, you yell at your neighbor and it's an older woman and she says, I'll get you because, you know, it was the problem was the fence around your corn, it wasn't my cows. If you'd had a better fence, this wouldn't have happened. And so some kind of disagreement occurs. Um, within the neighborhood. Um, and that's where a lot of witchcraft accusations come from. There's actually a very excellent book about witchcraft, mostly in Europe, to a certain extent in America, called Witches and Neighbors. And it's about the, by a guy named Robin Briggs, who's a, a British historian. And he makes a very strong case that a lot of these witchcraft cases in involve disputes among neighbors, kind of standard common disputes among neighbors. But let's say um, that dispute about the cows in the cornfield happened, and then three days later, um, 
you who've been cursed out by the, the supposed witch, that is by your neighbor, you start to have some other kind of a problem, like one of your cows breaks its leg and you have to kill it, or um, or your beer goes sour, or the milk won't t- churn properly into butter or something like that. And then you begin to think to yourself, hmm, I wonder if that neighbor bewitched my cow or bewitched me or bewitched my, my child if my child is sick or something like that. So that's the kind of thing that happens. And I might say, that witchcraft is very much uh, becomes a default explanation for things that are inexplicable otherwise, um, for sudden illnesses. Um, uh, Human beings always like to have causes for things. It's why I think we have so many conspiracy theories these days. There has to be something important that happen, happens to cause something important. And so there has to be a conspiracy. Well, that's the same kind of thing about witchcraft. You have to have some reason for something bad happening. And so you attribute it to a witch. And that's basically the 17th century explanation for things. That makes so much sense to me then why the doctor ends up being the person who goes in and will say, oh, there's some witchcraft occurring here because it's outside of his understanding. Uh, Yeah, the doctor who, well, he wasn't a trained doctor. He was just a local guy who seemed to know something about medicine, Dr. Briggs, Dr. Griggs, rather. Dr. Griggs seemed to know something about medicine. And in fact, he's really not a very lettered guy. I discovered that he signed an important legal document with an X. I mean, it's not even clear the guy's literate, um, but he is the local doctor. He is the equivalent of the local doctor in Salem Village. And so, um, yes, uh, when he can't diagnose the little girls as to what's wrong with them, he the default is it's be, it's witchcraft. But of course, they don't immediately turn to the legal process. And I think that's something we don't understand today, because there was a legal, there was a process for dealing religiously with witchcraft accusations. And basically, the first thing that happens is that Samuel Paris calls in neighboring uh, ministers to pray and fast over these girls. And that's supposed to solve the problem. And they go that goes on for some weeks. We don't know for sure how long, but it seems to be about a month that um, that this happens before any before they decide they're not going to deal with it religiously. They're going to have to deal with it legally. Mark the carrier sons were tortured. Yes. How was torture used in these trials specifically? That's the only time we know that there was any evidence or any statement about physical torture being used. We know that um, eventually sleeplessness was used and um, harsh words, shall we say. But the only time that torture is alleged is with the sons of Martha Carrier. Uh, And they were tied neck and heels, as it was said, which was in fact a punishment. It wasn't necessarily thought of as torture at the time. So... um, the, the question of why people confessed has always been something that people have been wondering about. But when it became clear, as it became clear later in the trials, that if you confessed, you would be kept alive so you could testify against other people, is when more and more people started to confess. Um, and one of the things I noticed was that when adults confessed late in the sequence of the trials, they accused only people who were already dead, who'd already been hanged, or they accused people who'd been accused by other people. They did not name new people. It seemed clear to me that it was very strategic when they confessed. They did not want to hurt anyone who wasn't already Um, hanged or already had been accused of others. However, children didn't do that. And a lot of the later confessors were, were children or very young teenagers. And they're the ones who just seems to have thrown names around with great abandon. And they're the ones who led to uh, many of the later accusations was confessions by children. And this, of course, was in Andover. That's where people were confessing was in Andover. It's very interesting. Um, It's a completely different pattern in Andover than you get in Salem Village. Salem Village, people accuse their enemies. 
in Andover, people accuse their friends and their relatives. Um, there's this one family where five sisters and the mother all confess and basically accuse each other and say they're all working together. Um, so it's just, it's, um, it's a very different pattern. And I know there's someone now working on Andover, and I hope that that person can explain the pattern in Andover, because I certainly had no particularly good explanation for it. Did the differences in the patterns in Andover affect how the rest of the trials went um, in Salem? Did it lead to changes in how the trials were uh, conducted? Most of the Andover confessions came very late in the day. Um, they The Andover confessions didn't start until the 15th of July. And at that point, there were only the August and September trial sessions left. So um, it didn't have that much of an effect. I mean, the confessors did come in. It was The confessors were important in the later phases of the trials, but not all of them were from Andover. So um, not all the confessors who came in were from Andover. So I don't, I wouldn't say that there was any big difference made by it. I guess the Andover phase is, is later. There was a thought that perhaps witchcraft ran in the family in a way or was passed down? Uh, oh, pregnancy was an excuse in England. It was, it was in English law. Um, you, it was called pleading your belly when a woman was accused of a, when a woman was convicted of a capital offense, she could, as they said, plead her belly. And if she was pregnant, if the midwives confirmed that she was pregnant, then she wasn't hanged until after she gave birth. And in this case, um, Elizabeth Proctor, the fact that she was pregnant saved her because by the time she gave birth, the, the executions had ended. So it saved her. Um, a fortuitous pregnancy. But that was, um, that was the standard English practice was you could plead your belly. Um, there were female pirates who pleaded their bellies and were not executed as a result, at least not until after they gave birth. So it was, it was nothing unusual. But you're right that it was thought that witchcraft could run in the family. And it wasn't just um, blood. It could also be someone in the same household. So someone who's um, a servant whose mistress was accused of being a witch might necessarily might come under uh, suspicion or vice versa. If a servant was accused of being a witch or thought to be a witch, was the mistress come under suspicion? That seemed to have happened with one of the three um, enslaved Africans who's accused in Salem that the mistress came under suspicion because the uh, servant was accused. And so, um, uh, or friends, uh, women who were close friends, if a woman was a close friend with someone who was thought to be a witch, that also was a, a suspicious circumstance and might lead one to at least come under some cloud of suspicion. Let's talk about Burroughs and Carrier and being called the king and queen of hell. Well, what's really interesting is that Martha Carrier is first called the queen of hell by a confessor. Burroughs uh, becomes the figured as the leader of the witches, thanks to the confessors. Um, but also because of the original accusations by Ann Putnam Jr. and Mercy Lewis. Um, Burroughs is the right person to be the leader of the witches because he's a minister and because he's a kind of a weird minister. That is, he's never been ordained. Um, he's been educated at Harvard. And because there's all kinds of gossip about him, which I explore in my book, he's he has a very peculiar relationship with his wives. It's hard to know a lot about the details, but he seems to have been quite brutal and quite an aggressive husband. Uh, he at least is accused of um, beating them, um, or at least being very um, controlling of them. Uh, he wants them to, quote, keep his secrets. And so the question becomes, what are those secrets he wants them to keep? Um, there are all kinds of rumors that swirl around him at his trial. There's testimony that he has unusual strength, which is based on his own boasting about his strength. So it comes back to haunt him. 
uh, he is someone who is cons very mysterious, and I, I would have loved to have found out more about him. I did everything I could to find out what I could, but um, he is a mysterious guy. Um, he's said to have prominent relatives in England. Um, I never tracked that down, so I don't know. But he is someone who aroused a lot of comment, um, who had a parlous relationship with... Salem Village, when he was the minister in Salem Village. He seems to have been much more popular when he was a minister in Falmouth, Maine. That is, um, he was there before King Philip's War. He then left, and they wanted him to come back, which he did. So he, um, he, did, he was treated better in Maine. He certainly was more highly regarded in Maine than he was in Salem Village. Perhaps it was because he was educated. There weren't a lot of educated people on the Maine frontier, and they may have liked the fact that he was a Harvard graduate, even if he wasn't an ordained minister. There does seem to have been some kind of a, a debate about where he would be, whether he would be in Falmouth or maybe in Black Point. There was some attempt to attract him someplace else to Black Point as a minister. So um, he had a different standing on the frontier than he had in Salem Village. Why was it significant that he was able to recite the Lord's Prayer? It was believed that a witch could not accurately recite the Lord's Prayer. And indeed, that was a test that was tried on some other people and who could not do it. Some of the accused um, it was tried on John Willard, and he couldn't do it. Uh, so when George Burroughs at the gallows recited the Lord's Prayer perfectly, uh, the account says, the, the eyewitness account says that he, that there was a murmur in the crowd and that they thought that he could not be a witch until Cotton Mather came up on horseback and said, no, no, a witch can do what he did. So then they hanged him. So um, <laughs> that's one time at which Cotton Mather is said to have had a real impact, definite impact um, on the trials himself, as opposed to just writing about it. That's one of the most well-known events that occurs. Another one is the the pressing death of Giles Corey. Right. How unusual was that act within the context of the rest of the civilization up to that point? Um, it was extremely unusual in the context of New England. It never was done at anybody else that we know of. And um, we don't even know why they did it. Um, it was a traditional medieval English punishment to force someone to enter a plea. But you have to understand, although we say it was because Giles Corey didn't enter a plea, he did actually say he was not guilty. He did say that. And we would say that was entering a plea. But he had to answer a second ritual question. And the second ritual question was, and how will you be tried? And he was supposed to say, by God and my country. And he refused to say that. And that's why they they decided to um, use this traditional English punishment. How they came up with that is not known. Um, and who basically decided it is not known, but it probably was William Stoughton, who was a very hardline guy, um, who was the chief justice and the lieutenant governor. But Giles Corey was not a nice man. I mean, he has this... In, in um, he becomes kind of a hero in um, um, Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible. But um, he had beaten a servant to death a few uh, some years earlier. He was not a nice guy, <laughs> and so it's thought he was just being his old irascible, nasty self when he refused to cooperate with the court. How significant was increased matter? in the ending of those trials? Well, it's really hard to know. We don't have a lot of evidence about how the trials ended. We have very sparse evidence, in fact. We have Samuel Sewell's diary that tells us about certain things that were very briefly that were said in um, meetings of the council, um, said by the governor, by William Phipps. Um, and we have some pamphlets. And it's certainly true that Increase Mather wrote a pamphlet that raised some questions. But 
Increase Mather also explicitly said that he agreed with his son Cotton. And Cotton wrote this, this not just a pamphlet, a book, Wonders of the Invisible World, defending the trials. And even though Increase Mather says um, in, his, in his, it's more than a pamphlet, it's, uh, it's not, but it's not a book. I don't know how to describe it. Even though he says in his treatise, that you have to be very careful about these trials, he still says he would have convicted George Burroughs. So it's not as though he's a complete opponent of the trials, nor is um, God, Samuel Willard, um, who also writes about, about the trials at the time, and who's uh, whose publication, when it appears, is said to have been published in Philadelphia when it clearly wasn't. It was published in Boston. It had fake publication information on the title page because Phipps had basically said no publications about Salem, about the trials, to try to keep the debate down. So it's, it's just really hard to know exactly what happened, except we do know, we can say, that public opinion did seem to turn against the trials. And they did seem to turn against the trials after the second set of accusations, after the accusation, after the, sorry, after the second set of trials and executions, and the executions on the 22nd of September. Um, opinion seems to have turned pretty strongly against the trials after that. And I, I would speculate that it's because those people were hanged with a lot less evidence than people had been hanged with before. Those trials were rushed, um, and they they did seem to be rushed to judgment in those trials. And so I think that's one of the things that led to deep concerns among people, among, shall we say, thinking people in Boston um, and in Salem uh, that caused an uproar. And then in addition, in October, when Increase Mather goes to the prison in Salem to talk to a group of women who had confessed, and they all take it back. And that too, I think, was important. And that was about the middle of October. So that was about three weeks after the last set of executions. Um, when they, they take it back and they talk about how they were basically convinced, convinced to confess by magistrates, sometimes by their own relatives, who said, well, you may not realize you were a witch, but you clearly were because of X and then cited some evidence to them. So um, I think that was also very meaningful in helping to convince Phipps that he could not maintain the trials any longer, or at least the trials in the court of Orior and Terminer, and that the rules had to change and that spectral evidence could not be allowed when the trials continued in January under the regular courts. I might add that, of course, throughout this entire period, there was no regular court system until the Massachusetts Assembly could meet in the fall under the new charter, and they could pass a law to establish a court system, which then held the trials in January and in May. Um, but the only court going was the Court of Orior and Terminer until, until the legislature met and adopted that law. Let's jump way back then <laughs> to the halfway covenant. Oh, dear. That's way back. I know, I know. <laughs> well, if, since Samuel Paris rejected the halfway covenant, what it meant was that people who had been baptized as children, but who could not satisfy the church with testimony that they had achieved saving faith, that they had experienced saving faith, that they were not allowed to be members of the church. They had to attend church services, but they were not allowed to um, be, mem be official members of the church. The halfway covenant allowed people who had been baptized as children but had not yet experienced saving faith to, in effect, be members of the church, to be under the church's supervision and to have communion and to have their babies baptized. Samuel Paris, by taking a hard line on the halfway covenant, meant that people in Salem Village who had been baptized as children could not be halfway members. And therefore, for example, when the church 
had communion, which they did once a month, they had to get up and leave. They could not stay. And this really divided the congregation in dramatic ways. Um, and it meant that people could not have their babies baptized, which was a very important thing when there was heavy infant mortality. You wanted to have your baby baptized um, at a time when 25% um, of children died statistically before the age of one. Can we talk about captivity narratives? Well, captivity narratives were published accounts by people of their captivities by Indians. And of course, the best known one was that of Mary Rowlandson from King Philip's War. And she was in fact a captive of Witamu, who was um, an associate of King Philip. That was published at the time. Many of the things we now call captivity narratives are published later. So it's not so much narratives or captivity narratives as it is the experience of the captives themselves and how that's, those stories would have spread through the community. So it's not so much the publications except for Mary Rowlandson as it is the actual experience of captivity and how people would have talked about it. Um, and one of the things I talk about in my book is the accounts that were well known of people uh, who had been captured in, the, uh, in, in King Philip's War um, and had experienced various um, um, trials and tribulations, shall we say, and indeed um, atrocities, what we would call atrocities, um, committed by the Native people on them, uh, especially if they tried to escape. Um, so, um, and how that seems to have been in the minds of people in, in uh, Essex County in 1692. Visions of uh, someone being roasted over a fire, for example, or um, uh, visions uh, or accounts of people who tried to escape from their Indian captors as they were trekking north to Canada after captivity, being, hat being uh, tomahawked in the head, something like that. Um, so we know those stories were spread around, whether they were published or not. So it was definitely in the minds. Definitely in people's minds. And one of the things that struck me as I was reading the material was how present the Indian War was in people's minds. Um, one of the accused people, um, Sarah Osborne, talks about having nightmares of Indians. And one of the women who confessed, Mary Toothaker, um, talks about um, how she confessed because um, the devil came to her in the shape of an Indian and told her that he would save, that if she became a witch, he would save her from the Indians. And since he came to her in the shape of an Indian, she believed him, and so she confessed. And she actually never took it back. What's interesting is that she um, was in jail. She was from Bilrica, and she was in jail in Salem when the Indians attacked her neighborhood in Bilrica and killed her closest neighbor. She was in jail confessing to being a witch wow. at the instigation of the devil in the shape of an Indian, and she never took it back. She literally never took it back. It, she, her life was saved by, be, by confessing to be a witch. She would have been killed if she had been in Belrica that weekend. And instead, she was in Salem, in jail. But then she was killed several years later in another Indian raid. And Belrica is only 20 miles from Salem. I mean, that just shows you how close the war was to what was going on. That's the, the big question. How widespread is the war? Uh, well, as I said, it's about 20, Bill Rick is only 20 miles away. Now that was the closest um, attack that I know of to Salem. But remember, all these people had relatives in Maine and New Hampshire. And the people in Maine and New Hampshire were constantly under threat, um, even in the low, in the most southern parts of Maine and New Hampshire. In um, what's now Portsmouth, which was then called Strawberry Bank, what was uh, Wells, Maine. There were attacks nearby um, all the time. Um, and they were um, 
the people felt under constant threat, shall we say. Um, so the attack in Bilrico was the closest, but eventually later in the war, actually after 1692, there was a big attack on Andover. Um, so it's not as though the war wasn't right there. And of course, remember, these are the, the men are militiamen and they're going out to fight. So all the above. So how was military service treated at that time? Um, military service was an obligation of um, all men between the ages of 16 and 50. And uh, they were supposed to keep muskets at the ready and have ammunition. Everybody was supposed to have their own gun and their own ammunition. And they were to be there to be called on when they were needed. And so um, a lot of times the men were indeed called up in both King Philip's War and King William's War to go up to the frontier, to go north to the frontier and to fight. And there are some um, very detailed accounts that have survived to us of some of the battles that occurred, especially around Black Point in southern Maine. So there's a, there's a pretty definite fear that exists in, in the colonies at the time of the indigenous neighbors that are yes. not far. Yes. Them. How were they written about within the community? They're written about, you know, it, and it varies because, of course, for years they had had relatively peaceful relationships with them. It wasn't as though this was a constant warfare. I mean, until the 1670s, there was a lot of trading going on, a lot of back and forth um, um, travel and so forth. Um, they're written about very matter-of-factly, actually. They're not written about as, as um, like, savages we don't understand because they did know, they, they knew each other. Um, uh, one of the best accounts we have is from the initial attack on Falmouth in um, 16, in, the, in 1675, and basically um, a Wabanaki who is known in the neighborhood comes in and and comes to a farm and says, um, "I know you're missing a cow. I know who took that cow. I will help you find it." So this is you know not a big deal. Then of course what he does is he leads the other people to attack the farm, but that's another matter. Um, but we can see that there's a, you know, the arrival of a, an Indian on your doorstep is not necessarily um, a frightening event. Or um, one of the incidents that I talk about in great detail in the book, it happens in New Hampshire, where a group of Indians comes to trade at a trading post. That's what they say they're doing. And then um, it's a cold night. The women say, can we sleep inside? The the Traders say, sure, the, in, the women, women sleep inside, but when everybody's asleep, they open the doors and the men come in and attack. The trader and his men, who are known for years for having, for having cheated the Indians, so it's a chance for them to get back at the, at the, um, at the traders. So it's, um, but you see this sort of pattern of what you might call standard interaction that has been broken by these wars. Some of the accused, they escaped from jail. Yes. How, how did that come about? How did that happen? Well, if you pay attention to where they are, remember there are a lot of people in jail. Um, they're not just in Salem. The jail in Salem is too small to hold them all. The jail in Salem town, that's what we're talking about. They're too small to hold them all. So they've been scattered around other places. And it happens that a lot of the leading people who are accused of being witches are sent to Boston. And I am convinced that the Boston jailer had his hand out for bribes and that it was from the Boston jail that a lot of these people escaped. So um, it, it's not written down anywhere, but he basically took money to let people go. I think there's no question um, in my mind. There's no question in my mind that he was, he was bribable and uh, probably earned a pretty penny from letting all these wealthy people go. One of them being my very own ancestor, Mary Bradbury, who was held and suddenly managed to escape. Guess what? She had a wealthy husband, so. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Thankfully. Is there any particular reason why they fled over a lot of them took refuge in New York? Well, New York was seen as a more open society. It was more diverse. There were lots of people there from different places. It wasn't controlled by Puritans. Remember, Anne Hutchinson fled to New York, too, when she was fleeing from the, um, from the Puritan authorities in first Massachusetts Bay and then ultimately Rhode Island when she thought they were going to come after her in Rhode Island. She, too, fled to New York. 
So it's not that surprising that they went to New York. It's the closest place that seems to offer them kind, some kind of refuge. And by the way, these are not the only people who are accused of witches in the 17th century who go to New York. There are other recorded cases of similar people. Um, I might add that I, I went to New York. I went to look at correspondence from the period. And I went looking, I was hoping I would find a letter from somebody saying, guess who I met at dinner last night, but I didn't find any such letter. I, I was hoping I would see some evidence of somebody who had fled from Boston while they were in, or fled from Boston or Salem or whatever, while they were in New York, but I couldn't find a trace of it. Too bad. One of the many things I couldn't find. There were many things I looked for that I couldn't find. Well, we have Phipps. Yes. Uh, and he writes his report in October right. to send back. Right. How does he position himself with regards to the trial? Phipps is really good at covering his butt. Phipps is a master at not letting on that he knew the, all along what was going on. I mean, Phipps writes this letter saying to the people in London, Oh my God, I just got back. I've been fighting Indians on the frontier all summer and I came back and I found this horrible situation and I stopped it. That was so untrue. He, it was true that he was just back from the frontier, but he'd only been on the frontier for two weeks at that time. And so, be, and I show in my book that he was meeting with members of the council who were also the judges, who were also the military leaders th regularly throughout the summer. Those minutes are available in the records in England. And they show that Phipps was talking to them regularly. So don't tell me they never said anything about the witchcraft trials because that was the biggest thing going on. It's not written down that they had those conversations, but of course they did. And of course, he wanted to get out from under. And he did. I mean, he he didn't actually because he was recalled and they were going to challenge him. He was, he was under a lot of pressure to be challenged in England. And then he died um, before he could be called before the Privy Council. So uh, it's not as though he completely escaped, but he did. That letter was such a stunning letter to me when I found it, where he basically said, oh, I knew nothing that was happening. I was gone. It was not true. He knew absolutely what was happening. It's a great political move. And Tad Baker, to tell you more about that, since he's a biographer of Phipps. <laughs> we can ask him as well. Ask him as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Stone is seeing that there is a lot of dissent for the trials and yeah. for especially the executions. Mm -hmm. Right. Why is he so set on executing people? Uh, Stoughton is a real hard line guy. I mean, that's all we know. We don't know a lot about Stoughton. Like many other people who were involved in the trials, his papers have not survived and or his personal papers have not survived. What we basically have from Stoughton is some sermons. And recently, by the way, some new sermons of his have been discovered. But basically, we just don't know much about him. Um, he was a bachelor. Uh, he never married. Um, he was back and forth to England. Uh, he was an ordained minister as well as a judge. And he was a man of considerable standing in Massachusetts Bay Colony. But um, he... Uh, we just don't know a lot about him. He he did not. If he kept personal records, they have not survived. So we just don't know. He's he's a mysterious figure because he is so hardline. He is so hardline. I mean, I know what happened to the papers of the judge Wade Winthrop, or I'm convinced I do, because Wade Winthrop's papers were purged. I mean, I don't think Wade Winthrop purged them, but I think a, a descendant of his purged them before he gave them to the Massachusetts Historical Society. We have extensive correspondence from Wade Winthrop, um, who was a judge and was a militia officer, was a member of the council. Um, we have extensive evidence of letters from him to his brother, uh, Fitzjohn Winthrop, in the late 1680s, in 1691. There are no surviving letters for 1692. There are no surviving letters for 1693. And there are lots of letters for 1694 and there are, there are, thereafter. And so I know, probably not Winthrop himself, but probably the descendant who gave the papers to the Massachusetts Historical Society said, mm, I don't want these letters to survive. And so he threw them in the fire. So we don't have them. <laughs>
It would be lovely to know what Wade Winthrop wrote to his brother about what it was like to be a judge in the witchcraft trials, which is what I was looking for when I went to look at the papers and I didn't find them. The only record I ever found from someone who was a judge in a witchcraft trial talking about his reaction to the to an accuser came from Connecticut, not from Massachusetts. How did it? How did it spread so? Well, my answer is the Indian the Indian War. I mean, it's the, it was the fears of the Indian War because I think the trigger um, to making it explode the way it did is the confession of Abigail Hobbs. And Abigail Hobbs was from the main frontier. She was a refugee from the main frontier. She was a teenager. She was the third person to confess to being a witch after Tichaba and Dorcas, uh, Dorothy Good. And she um, basically said that the devil had recruited her in the woods outside her home in Falmouth, Maine, uh, four years earlier. And she's the one who made the connection to the main frontier. She's the one who made the connection to the witches. And as I show in my book, the number of accusations just absolutely exploded after Abigail Hobbs's confession. So I think that's what made the difference. And that's what convinced me that the Indian War was the crucial thing, because she was the one who introduced the Indian War into the narrative. And then um, everything blew up. There have been so many explanations over the years about how and why these ail ailments, these afflictions oh, came God. about, yeah. right? Today, people tend to want medical explanations for the kinds of afflictions that we see. Therefore, some people have said, ah, epileptic fits. There's no evidence that there's any epilepsy involved here. Um, some people have said, ah, ergot poisoning. Well, ergot poisoning is maybe possible, but not as possible as people think. And even if it was, it doesn't explain anything of significance because what is significant is not the fact that people had hallucinations, it's what they saw in those hallucinations and how they described what was happening to them. That is that they were being attacked by the specters of witches. And you can have a hallucination without having that kind of a vision. So I don't see ergot, even if it's possible, um, which I don't, which I think is very unlikely, is a real explanation. Um, the, I researched for my book cases in England and America before 1692 in which young children began to have what were described as fits that were then dis attributed to witchcraft. And I discovered that it was a not unusual pattern. It, was, it wasn't as though it was common, but it was known. It was a known pattern. And it was a pattern when um, children were in intensely, intensely religious households, as indeed they were in the household of Samuel Paris. So it does seem to be a kind of a conversion um, experience um, after uh, over you know event. And indeed, in the 18th century, during the Great Awakening, these kinds of, quote, fits were interpreted as conversion experiences. In the 19th century, they were, con they were, they were um, interpreted as hysterical fits on the part of women. In the 20th century and the 21st century, they're, uh, they're um, interpreted as medical things, as things that have to do with medicine. I mean, it, these behaviors are known, they just have different interpretations at different times. And in the 17th century, they were, uh, the interpretation was witchcraft. Um, it's not as though these are un, these are totally unknown um, events, uh, totally unknown uh, reactions of young women, mostly to different circumstances. So I, <sighs> I think that's what was going on. I mean, well, as I said, I think that the that the um, the a lot of the basis of the main refugees accusations can be attributed to PTSD. Um, it seems to me that a couple, or at least one of the accusers in Salem Village, is faking it, and that's Sarah Vibber. 
um, the 30 something housewife, we could call her the goody vibber, who, if you look at her, everything she says is sort of me too. She never is the initial accuser of anybody. But when and somebody comes forward with an accusation, she'll say, Oh, yeah, that happened to me too. That happened to me also. And then she is regarded as um, a crucial witness by the judges because she is older. Um, we just don't, we don't know enough about her background. Um, it would be wonderful if we could know more about her. Uh, we know that she's married to her second husband, but we don't know who her first husband was, and we don't know who her husband's first wife was. It's just really, really hard to find out about her. So, but she seems to me to be someone who, whose testimony is dubious, even in the 17th century. Think about today, sure. in, in this country right now, in the world right now, we, we are different. But we have the same fears, we have the same anxieties. Sure. I mean, right now, I mean, well, if you look in the 50s, there's a fear of communists. I mean, that's what Arthur Miller built the uh, crucible around, that kind of fear that developed the uh, McCarthyite um, atmosphere that he was writing about um, and making the analogy. Today, um, we see a lot of um, uh, comments about fears of um, Muslims, Sharia law, and so forth, even though there's no actual evidence that anyone is ever trying to impose Sharia law in the United States. There's um, a lot of, um, uh, there are some people out there who believe it, or who at least say they believe it. So um, it's not as though, um, especially in the wake of 9-11, that we are um, free from fears of the mysterious unknown. And in the and in the I would say in the eighties there was the fear of uh, there was the fear of the satanic rituals in child uh, childcare facilities, which in retrospect seems really weird and strange, but led to the arrest and conviction of a number of people. So, uh, and that's been written about in the context of witchcraft. So, um, scholarship about witchcraft. John Demos did that. So. What don't people ask you enough about for this subject? Oh, dear. <laughs> I would say that what people don't ask me enough about is actually a topic we've talked a fair amount about, which is about the power structure and about the role of the judges and the, the guilt of the judges, really. I mean, if you... People today tend to, when they think about Salem witchcraft and they think about who's responsible they blame the young accusers, especially the young, quote, hysterical female accusers. I don't blame them. I blame the judges who should have been, by modern parlance, the adults in the room. They should have stopped it. And they could have stopped it. And in Connecticut, in the early 1660s, the then governor, John Winthrop Jr., did stop it when there was a movement towards a potential witchcraft crisis where there were 10 or 12 accusations and there was the possibility of more and he basically he was a scientifically minded guy and he basically put a stop to it so the judges could have put a stop to this but they didn't and so one of the things i wanted to do with my book was to lay the blame where i think it belongs it doesn't belong with the quote hysterical girls which is the way it's usually presented in popular culture um because it didn't have to go the way it went it didn't have to happen and the um the men who could have stopped it didn't because it was to their benefit not to stop it um so that's that's i would say what people don't know enough about. Um, the myth that it was the responsibility of the girls really starts right after, right in the wake of the witchcraft crisis, right in the very first critiques. People who are criticizing the witchcraft trials do not criticize the judges. They explicitly don't criticize the judges. Increase Mather does not criticize the judges. The other critics, early critics of the trials, do not criticize the judges. They criticize the accusers. And so in sort of in American mythology, it's this, quote, hysterical females who are responsible. But that's not right. It's the judges who are responsible. <laughs>
This episode of Unobscured was executive produced by me, Matt Frederick, and Alex Williams, with music by Chad Lawson and audio engineering by Alex Williams. The Unobscured website has everything you need to get the most out of the podcast. There's a resource library of maps, charts, and links to Salem document archives online, as well as a suggested reading list and a page with all of our historian biographies. And as always, thanks for supporting this show. If you love it, head over to applepodcasts.com slash unobscured and leave a written review and a star rating. It makes a huge difference for the show's growth. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>